Hey, welcome back to this special two-part episode, or I guess it's two episodes. Yeah. A, a two-part presentation of uh, audience Q&A with Pastor Tom. We kicked this off last week answering some great questions that we received at a recent event that we did, uh, and also some questions that you have uh, either sent us via email or have commented in previous videos and that kind of stuff. So we're continuing to go through those questions today because there are just too many questions to try to cram into one episode, and we're getting such great answers from Pastor Tom. we got to continue that today. Before we go back to Pastor Tom for the second half of that conversation, I want to encourage you to go to saddleback.com slash books. And if there are uh, other questions rattling around in your mind that um, that are kind of hanging you up that you don't have good answers to, I want to uh, encourage you as strongly as possible to go to our book recommendation page, saddleback.com slash books. And if you uh, click over to, what tab do I have that under? I believe it's under... It's under Encouragement. It's the one on the far right. Yeah. It's under Encouragement. And uh, it's a book by Pastor Rick called God's Answers to Life's Difficult Questions. And you can click through to a link to Amazon and purchase that book. Uh, but that's a great place where you can go and get some more answers to questions that might still be kind of bugging you a little bit. So go check that one out. Uh, also, as we said last time, you can um, comment below if you're watching on YouTube or send us an email at maturity at saddleback.com if you're listening to the podcast. And let us know what questions you've still got that you might want to hear us answer in future episodes. Or more importantly, not us, but someone like Pastor Tom who really knows his stuff. Yeah, also, and feel free, we'll link in the show notes below to the videos for foundations. If there's something that you're like, ah, I'm still curious about um, good and evil or about creation and they, they, they didn't really touch on that then go and, and watch the videos on that uh, we have the really foundations good. videos for those so check those out excellent idea all right without any further ado let's get back to our conversation with Tom let's see I think it's my turn it is. Um, why did Adam and Eve's rebellion lead to punishment for us all this one's kind of interesting. So the genealogy of the fall kind of a thing. So yes. how did that how did that result in fall for everyone? Okay, you guys are going to listen to this answer and your eyes are going to want to roll in the back of your head cuz <laughs> not cause, mine. Cause I think I've, no, I've given this answer before oh, okay. and I and I just this is where you get a little he bit doctrinal <laughs> and there's this moment of I don't even want to know this stuff. But it's important <laughs> to know some some things. I'll tell you whoever asked happened. this question probably wants that kind of exactly. response. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So there really are different theories doctrinally about mm. how Adam and Eve's sin went to the entire human race. Mm. There is a theory that it was genetic, that something happened to them genetically and then it was passed on to the human race. Mm. Uh, that is not correct. How do I know that's not correct? Well, when you get to the New Testament, a woman named Mary has a baby named Jesus, mm. and no sin is passed on to Jesus. Mm. Uh, the Catholic Church needs to th to to uh, theorize that Mary was somehow made perfect genetically, mm -hmm. right. spiritually. But if you, that's what you have to believe if you believe that the that immaculate sin was passed conception on genetically. Yeah. There's also a very strange down through the years. This, you can see this way back to the Middle Ages, but you can even see it in some people's thinking today mm. that when you start to think that sin is passed along genetically, it comes into people's thinking about sex. It's a very mm. strange thing that happens. And so they, they begin to think of sex as evil or even birth as evil mm. because somehow genetically you're passing, you're passing this You're along. propagating sin in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I know that's too deep for some of us. You're going, I never thought that way. I'm just telling you philosophically, yeah. it has definitely affected people's thinking about sex yeah. through the years. And God... Uh, you didn't think we were going to get into a talk about hey, sex. Hey, sex talk. About Adam right. and Eve. But God <laughs> made sex as a good thing. You know, and the scriptures teach us very, very clearly that uh, God made us to be one as an expression of his creation of us in the Old Testament and the story we're talking about with Adam and Eve. Yeah. And in the New Testament, we're very clearly taught that uh, God's creativity and his love for us is seen in the union of a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself talked about it, talking about this story. So getting back to Adam and Eve, uh, when they sin, uh, the doctrinal term for this is federally. Uh, that means all at once, like the federal government, that's the whole thing, that all at once sin was passed on spiritually to the entire human race. Mm. And that's because they served as the representatives of the entire human race. People don't like to think this, but the truth is any of us that would have been there would have committed the same sin. Mm. Uh, I know I've said that to some people, and they say, oh, no, I can't believe that. 
And that I wonder about their hearts in yeah. that moment. Because the truth of the matter is, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. It's not Adam and Eve sin. Adam and Eve fell short of the glory of God. Yeah. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, yeah. and what happened in the fall that affected all of creation uh, spiritually, affected not just us, but all of the earth, all the animals, all the heavens was affected spiritually by what happened there. Hmm. It put us in a fallen world where inevitably we will sin. Every, mm-hmm. every one of us, because we're a part of this world. And because of that, Jesus Christ came to give us the way out, gave mm-hmm. us, give us the way of, of, of escape. Uh, when you read through the book of Romans about this, particularly you read about uh, Adam being the, the, the first man, yeah. and that he is the one who sinned, but Jesus Christ is the second Adam. Uh, and because of Jesus Christ's death for us, all of us can be released <clears throat> from sin. So it's the same thing. Jesus didn't pass it along genetically. Right, I was going to say that's where that along bro- breaks federally. down. Federally, he passed yeah. it along to all of us spiritually mm. through what he did on the cross. The opportunity to trust. Now, I, I wish it, it's not quite federally because in the Old Testament, uh, federally means immediately we all had that. Mm-hmm. It's a mm. it's a different thing because we have a choice. Right. So it's by choice now. It's personally, not mm. federally. Mm. Personally, he gave us the choice to say whether I want to trust in what he did for me on the cross. But he gave mm. that choice to every one of us. Yeah. There's not one of us who cannot make that choice. Right. Mm. So thank you for that in-depth doctrinal question and answer. And those yeah. of you that have fast-forwarded through this part, <laughs> I'm going to just pause a little bit now and say, stop the fast-forwarding now <laughs> for the next question. <laughs> I just want to say, I, I took a class last semester, and this question exactly came up. And I was, I was very happy to hear your response because... <laughs> Uh, because I was thinking the same lines, and I got yes. into some interesting discussion boards with some people who took the other route. So anyway, I love no, that was this a great question. response. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, I got the next one, which is, um, why has God not spoken to us in over 2,000 years? Well, the simple answer is he didn't need to because his final word is in his son, Jesus Christ. Uh when you look at the Bible, it's the story of Jesus Christ coming to this world, giving a sin for us being resurrected. Hmm. That's the story. Mm-hmm. And so God obviously speaks to us through his spirit. I mean, I understand the, the nature of that question. They're, they're talking about why hasn't he spoken any new scriptures right. mm-hmm. in that amount of time. He does speak to us through his spirit. He speaks to us in prayer. He speaks to us through sermons and hopefully through podcasts sometimes. <laughs> he speaks to us a lot of ways. But he hasn't spoken any new scriptures since then. Why? Because our faith is in Jesus. Our faith is, is in trusting in him. Mm. And uh, I think that's a good thing to remind ourselves of. In, the, in this generation, particularly a good thing. That as Christians, the reason we're, 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 we're Christians is because we trust in Christ. The Bible tells us about the Christ that we trust in. But mm. we're not Christians because we trust in the Bible. We, we, we're, we're Christians because we trust in Christ, whom the Bible tells us about. Now, is that splitting hairs? Well... For some people, uh, their, their trust is only in an old book, hmm. and they think they're Christians. They've been in church all their lives, and they keep the rules, and they keep the laws and regulations. It's a pharisaical form of Christianity, where my trust is in a book, but my trust isn't in a person, hmm. in Jesus Christ. And uh, so we have to be very clear that it's what happened in the cross and the resurrection that, we are, that we're trusting in. Hmm. And that's why the book ends with Jesus, the story of Jesus, because he is the word. He is the final word. He is the last chapter uh, of God's story of salvation. And that's what the Bible is, is God's story of salvation. Yeah. No, that's great. Here's another one that's going to take us in the angelology direction just a little bit. Uh, If God created everything and everything was good, how did Satan come into being, which is more of a I guess, demonology angle on that. But how did Satan come into being if God is good and created a good creation? How does a being like Satan arise? I don't know. Hmm. And I don't know any more in-depth answer to give to that question than I don't know. I feel like any of us that try to answer why God allowed evil, I know God allows evil. It didn't slip in by accident. It didn't come into this world because he's not weak, because he's too weak. Right. Uh, it, it's not like God took took a day off and all of a sudden <laughs> evil happened. Right. Uh, I do know Satan is the source of evil. 
I understand the Bible teaches that, us that. It doesn't teach us why Satan chose to rebel. Mm -hmm. There's lots of theories about it. The most popular ones revolve around some argument in heaven about the fact that Jesus, as God's son, was going to come to earth, become a man, and die on a cross. That's a great theory. There is no biblical evidence for that. Yeah. It's just a Bible It sounds very fictional. Yeah, it's, it's like fan it's, fiction on the Bible. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's, yeah. it's good. I mean, there's some bad theories that are out there, mm -hmm. uh, specifically that God was weak or that God, mm. was, God was himself evil in some ways, mm. or that Satan was more powerful. Uh, it, Satan is just a created being. He's just an angel. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know why God allowed evil. I know the result mm -hmm. of, of the other side of it, uh, that it means we get choice, we have choice. And in us having choice, it means we can choose to love him. I do know looking from our side that we can see that evil being in the world uh, results from human choice. And if there was no human choice, there'd be no evil in the world. Hmm. And we can see from our side that that same choice that allows us to choose evil also allows us to choose a kind of love that's going to last for all of eternity. Mm. But that's not really an answer. That's a little bit from a human side, because all kinds of questions come up about that. Like, well, why couldn't God make us so we could only choose love? I mean, he's God, right? Why doesn't he make us that way? And I don't know the answer to that. So mm. whatever, wherever I go with that, in my understanding of it, I always have to come back to the place of saying, I don't know. Mm. I don't know why God allows, allows evil. I, I do know he has given us his son to let us escape the evil of this world. I do know that he's promised us a heaven where there'll be no more evil. I do know that he's going to one day do away with all evil and in his justice punish all evil that by his power will be punished. I do know that Satan's not going to endure. I knew that, no, do know that Satan's not going to be empowered in hell somewhere, continually mm. yeah. punishing people. He's going to be the most punished being in heaven, not a punisher in heaven. I know all of those things from the Bible, but I don't know the answer to, to that one. Why yeah. did God allow evil? Yeah. Uh, when we get to heaven, we can ask him. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we'll need to Yeah. when we get to heaven. I don't know. That's what I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know if just seeing his face, the answer will be there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but I'll, I'll know when I get there. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> what a great answer. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Jason, your turn. Uh, that it is. Uh, so and this question says, why didn't God forgive Adam and Eve? One transgression, and out they went. As written, by the way. As, as written. written. Out they went. <laughs> I just see God's big old boots swinging down. Goodbye. Boink. Well, uh, the one, the, the, like, what? Come on. Just one bite of fruit? <laughs> right, right. And that's it? <laughs> what happened with that bite of fruit was the ultimate of all sin. And it is what keeps anybody from God. And that is Satan comes to Eve, and then it gets passed along to Adam, that if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. You will know good and evil. So I really believe that that happened. Mm -hmm. I believe that they ate the fruit, and God told them that that would happen. Satan told them that would happen, and it is what happened. So they knew good and evil. Before that, they were innocent. They only knew good. So when they knew good and evil, they couldn't help but do evil. Hmm. When they were innocent, they could do only good. When they knew both, they couldn't help themselves but continue to do more and more and more evil. We can't handle it. You know, hmm. It's that old movie line. You can't handle the truth. Yeah. We can't handle the evil. Hmm. We, we, we're not all powerful. God can know evil and not do it. Once they took that bite, they knew evil, and then they would inevitably do it. Hmm. So remember, in the garden, uh, God says, we got to banish them from the garden, lest they eat of the tree of eternal life and now live forever. So God is saying, I don't want them to live forever like this. Right. Who would want to live forever like this planet is? Yeah. I mean, I know it's science fiction. People say they would want to. But with the evil that we face on this planet, who would want that? Yeah, and maybe because so we've remember, lost a vision of they what it were could out, be like. They were out, also protected them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a death actually protects us, believe it or not, yeah. mm -hmm. from living in eternity in this evil world. We don't see it that way from this side, but when you read the Bible, you begin to see it that way. Yeah. So they had this, this ultimate sin. They thought they knew better than God. 
In one sense, they were saying, okay, God, we want what you have, we just don't want you. Right. That's the ultimate definition of sin. Yeah. Is God, I want the stuff, I want what you have, I want the goodness, I want the beauty of this world. I just don't want you telling me how to run my life. Mm. I want to run my life. And uh, because of that sin and what happened in the Garden of Eden, that's why God put them out. But Mm. I think it's good, let me just go back and say, he was not just banishing them, he was also protecting them and taking them out of that garden. You know, when you read Genesis chapter 3 and you read that account, you actually see a real, even though Adam and Eve had just committed this atrocity against God, I mean, a real travesty against against their creator, um, you you can feel some tenderness in God and in the way he deals with them, even in the putting out and even in the way he responds to them in that moment where he he approaches them relationally. Where yes. are you? Did yeah. you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that I told you not to eat from? And this whole conversation and um, even the him making garments for them as yes. he sends them out. That's very good. I think it's important There's that compassion. we don't... Yeah. Yeah. There's tenderness there. We can't see that as a one-dimensional story where God just right. said, you're out of here. There's the protection element that you've just talked about, for keeping us from being... But there's also the compassion. But there's a compassion, about. right. Yes, that's right. also there. Uh, we were, we're writing a sermon on this. This is going to be really? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the fatherly part. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you right. see God right. as a father. You see his fatherhood coming out. I'm in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. You see it in the Garden and of And in the yes. Garden of Gethsemane. Yes. All the gardens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Just something that sparked to mind as we were talking about the fruit. I hate to keep Is it a what-if question? Uh, no, no. Okay, then no. yes, you can ask <laughs> um, a follow-up. <laughs> this is a question of, um, so, so they, they, they both eat of the fruit, they both fall. Do you believe that, because you spoke to the genetic thing, the yes. whole biological aspect, actually, or the non-aspect of sin biologically in that sense, um, do you think that there was something inherent in the fruit that caused this knowledge of good and evil, or do you think that it was the very fact of disobeying God in that act is what unlocked this potential for evil in human beings? Yeah, it had to do with disobeying God, I think, in, mm-hmm. that, in that act. Yeah. And it affected, when we talk about uh, federally, it affected not just Adam and Eve, but Romans 8 says, the whole creation suffers the bonds of the pains of childbirth yeah. together until right. now. Right waiting yeah. for its redemption. So all of creation needs to be redeemed. All of mm. creation fell in some ways. So yeah. what you see happening in what we call natural disasters, mm. you know, you know, actually they're Adam and Eve disasters. Yeah. Uh, they started in the Garden of Eden. Mm. That's good. I, I heard someone say one time, a uh, long time ago, that they were postulating this idea that maybe the the fruit had some kind of toxin in it that damaged us <laughs> mentally and biologically yes. and enabled sin. I was like, wow. I think it was, that's... A, I think it was a spiritual I agree. transaction, yes. I, I certainly agree. Uh, okay, your turn, Jason, or mine? It's yours. All right. Um, oh, okay. Uh, why would God punish forever without end? What about rehabilitation? So I think they're talking about the, the foreverness of hell in this question. I think C.S. Lewis speaks... Uh, to me, the most um, not not just soberly, because he's very he he's very sober about the truth of hell, but also wisely about this when he talks about the fact that hell, people go to hell because they want to, mm-hmm. and uh, we've all or many of us heard the, the quote that in the end God. We will either say to God, thy will be done, or God will say to us, thy will be done. Right. And I think we have this thought in our minds that uh, in hell, uh, people are going to be just wishing all day long, I wish I was in, I wish I was in heaven, I wish I was in heaven, I wish I was in heaven. The story of the rich man and Lazarus that Jesus tells, the rich man who's in hell or in, in, in Hades, suffering doesn't say i wish i was in i wish i could be with lazarus in heaven he just says could he give me a drink here in hell Mm -hmm. he still doesn't want to be in heaven he doesn't want his life run by god even in hell Mm. if that's the spirit of your heart that takes you there that's an eternal uh, indication of who you are yeah so the the feeling that we have that people are going to be going oh i missed it i just missed it Mm -hmm. and i could have been in heaven for eternity uh, people are going to weep. They're going to gnash in teeth, their teeth because of the suffering that they're going through apart from God and what it's like to be apart from Him. But I, as, as Lewis writes about this, it, it helped me to realize people in hell are there because they want to be there. Hmm. And uh, 
the, the sadness to me is that even there, even in the suffering, they're still going to want to be there. Mm. We have some indication of that on earth. When people suffer, does it draw them towards God or away from God? It mm. draws some people to be bitter against God, to right. hate God. That's, that's how they build their own self-image. That's who they're building themselves on. Yeah. And um, I think there's some indication. We don't know about eternity as much as we'd like, but I think there's some indication that that's going to be true in eternity yeah. as well. Lewis, uh, paraphrasing, he describes hell as a place of torment, but whose doors are locked on the inside. Yes, that's a, yeah, that's a better way to say what I just said. You should answer. That. No, 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 no. But you made me think. You made me think of that. That that, um, and I don't know if it's he that said it or somewhere else that I read um, talked about for for the kind of person who inhabits hell. That kind of person would probably find heaven intolerable. Right. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah, heaven that would may be have the been place. Chesterton who said that. That one, might have been. Yes. Yeah. Who've influenced Lewis quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's great. All right, take us on. Um, I'm going to jump questions because I don't know how long we've been going and how much longer we have left, and I want to get to this decently practical question Good. here. Um, so uh, this one said, and this one was a comment that came in um, on the YouTube channel here. Good. It says, "How can I find common ground and relate to non-Christians without?" In neglecting my own beliefs, how do I know which "quote unquote" worldly things to be familiar with to build relationships with non-Christians, and where to draw the line? That's mm. a great question. Yeah, that it, is. it really is. I think for all of us, you know, we want to be able to be with people who aren't Christians without feeling like, oh, well, they got to leave now, you know, because <laughs> we're going to do this or we're going to do that. Um. I mean, obviously, let's, st let's start with the obvious. Uh, the Bible says don't participate in evil. And I, I know some Christians who feel like if I participate in some kind of evil with them, a, a radical example, they're going to a strip club. So I'm going to go to that club. With, I'm not going to look. You know, I'm going to turn my eyes. Well, that's participating in evil. And that's hurting your witness. I mean, mm -hmm. that's extremely obvious. Right. But... Now take it to some other maybe less obvious things. Sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna get just a little drunk with my friends, you know, just to show them that Christians can have a good time too. Well, the Bible says don't get drunk on wine or anything else that you might get drunk on. Uh, so to say that somehow that's going to cause them to come to Christ, well, they might come to Christ, but that's not what caused them to come to Christ. Don't fool yourself <laughs> right. that somehow you getting drunk is what caused them to come to Christ. <laughs> I've never heard that in anyone's testimony. You know, I was struggling, but my Christian friend got drunk with me, and no, that really actually, made the difference. They actually make fun of you. Yeah. If they know you're a Christian and you and you go down that road, they uh, they actually make make fun of you. I, I can, I just, uh, I haven't had this memory for a lot of years. When, when mm. I was in high school, I was a brand new believer. I was like a month old as a believer. Mm. And uh, somebody told me to start carrying my Bible to school, you know, that it would give you a chance to witness. I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but I go, well, that's cool. It's so a conversation piece. I carrying piece. my Bible to school. So I'm in like a physics class, and uh, some of the guys start making fun of me about it. And uh, one of my friends from church who was like a get drunk with the other football players guy, hmm. he tries to stand up for me. Hey, guys, don't do that. And they look at him and go, you don't have anything to say to us. And they just laughed at him. Hmm. Hmm. You know. So even in my young faith, I was a better witness, maybe in my misapplied faith to them in that moment than somebody who was somehow thinking that by doing the wrong thing, hmm. they're, they're going to be a better witness. So hmm. that's one side of it, for sure. the whole scale of that. If you know it's evil, if you know it's wrong, if your conscience tells you it's wrong, you don't do it to be a witness. Yeah. Just think of where that's going to take you. Yeah. You got to listen to your own conscience. Is could your conscience be wrong? Well, yeah. But the New Testament is pretty clear. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 8 that we do need to be sensitive to the conscience of other Christians and you need to be sensitive to your own conscience and let it grow, let it begin to understand. Hmm. So if your conscience is telling you don't do that, don't be there, then you need to listen to that yeah. and not think you're going to be a witness through that. Hmm. So what can you be a witness through? What's, what's the other side sure. of it? The other side of it is not feeling like you have to like make everything a spiritual conversation or every time you go out with the guys or the, the girls that somehow somehow you're bringing around to the Bible. Well, did you know that reminds me of a parable of yeah. Jesus? And can we talk about that for a few minutes? Yeah. It's like the sports star, you know, who, every, hey, great game. Well, it was only the Lord. <laughs> and I, I understand that, 
you know, but I also go, I'm pretty certain I, I saw you catch the ball. So you were involved in it somehow and the skill and training. Like I could never say it was only the Lord that I did that. Yeah. So there are more mature Christians in that moment who are able to give praise to Jesus in a good way, but also answer the interviewer's question. Give them, give them something that they need because they know the interviewer needs more than that. So there is this experience of relationship that was in the first question really that we talked about together mm -hmm. of being able to walk this line of being with people in every circumstance just having fun with them just laughing with them yeah uh, and in that looking for the opportunity to share with somebody about uh about your faith yeah yeah that's good and i think too we, we said earlier that well you said earlier that in the end it's the decision of the person the person's going to decide whether they will trust in Jesus or not. So you may invest in somebody, and they may in the end decide that they aren't going to trust in Jesus, they don't want to walk with Him, but at least at the end of that process that you've just described, you can walk away knowing you maintained your integrity through that process, you honored God, and right. sought to witness in a way that was you know, compatible with God's desires for our life, and you didn't sell out in order to win somebody to the gospel. And we right. don't always know what seeds are being planted through our maintaining of our integrity. Yeah. Too. That's true. I think we have time. If, if, oh. When somebody comes to Christ, it's because a lot of seeds were planted. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you ever get in a relationship where the first time you meet somebody, you happen to say, hey, I'm a Christian, and they go, oh, I'm interested in that. You tell them about Jesus and they accept Jesus. Don't walk away thinking, I'm the greatest evangelist <laughs> <Yeah>. ever. <laughs> Swish. <laughs> the only reason you got to do that is because maybe a hundred other people planted seeds in their life yeah. Yeah. that got them to that point, and you just happened to be the right person at the right time. You just yeah. say, God, yeah. thanks for your grace. I got to do that. But <laughs> yes. I don't even know their mom or dad that's praying sure. for them. I don't know their, yeah. their husband or their wife that's been grieving for them and yeah. has shared this with them so many times. But So just thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. I think we have time for one more, shall we? Uh, I think this is one that you can probably handle pretty, pretty quickly, answered. but I think it does deserve to be answered. I I, uh, I want to go for this one, which I think is very simple. It's just a five-word question. Where did God come from? Where did God come from? God didn't come from anywhere. It's a, in, in logic, it's called a category mistake, that you ask something of something that can't be asked of it, hmm. you know, uh, you know. If you ask, uh, how fast can a rock run? Mm. What? <laughs> how, it's where, a rock, not, not the rock. How uh, fast yeah. can the rock the run? Rock that is not a question. category <laughs> mistake. But uh, where did God come from? Uh, if you ask about anything that's eternal, where did it come from? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that's unanswerable because mm. uh, God has always existed. I can understand a little bit if, if I think about eternity going like this way from here now, mm -hmm. I can, okay, we're going to last, God's going to last forever. I cannot bring into my human mind eternity that way, that God has always existed. Because for every, everything in our lives, there's a start. Mm -hmm. Even this planet, there's a start. We read about it in Genesis. So we can't comprehend the fact we're, it's just too big for our brains because God's yeah. too big for us. Uh, the fact that God is eternal, but He is. Yeah. So He's always been, and yeah. He always will be. Yeah, that's great. He self exists. He just yes. is. There's he, no. He just. Yes. He is. Sweet. Uh, I am that I am. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That some of the most powerful and underappreciated words in the entire yes. Bible. That simple yes. phrase, "I am." Well, Tom, thanks so much for being here with us. This has been a lot of fun. Thank, I really love to talk about time. Scripture, and I hope that this was encouraging. To oh, someone. I know that it we was. We look forward to doing another one of these in the future. Yeah. That would be great. I'm sure this scratched plenty of itches that. out there. That uh, I'm sure plenty of these questions are ones that you out there listening or watching have struggled with in the past or have been up until this moment. Um, so i uh, glad you tuned in. Glad you're here. Do we have any doables we want to point up to? You've already listed a couple. Go to the books page and check out Pastor Rick's book on God's answers to life's difficult questions. We'll link to that in the show notes. That's a great one. Tom, do you have any other thoughts or, or helpful books that you would recommend on any of these topics? Oh, wow. There's there's a lot of helpful books. <laughs> yeah. On, on all this may be the hardest topics. question yes, of the day. I asked you a lot that, of questions today, my, but this one's the <laughs> hardest. That is my hardest question. I just did a book review process for some Christian book awards, so I've read like Oh gosh! I don't know. Forty books in the last three months. Wowzers! This, uh, this award and one of my uh, I, I mentioned a couple of books. Just just look up Christian books on hospitality oh, that yeah. have been written recently. Mm -hmm. There's uh, like like I said three or four of them. One of them is Kay Warren's book 
on uh, sacred privilege. I know yeah. it's a book for pastors' wives, and you might think, ah, that's not really my deal. Mm. But she talks about the beginning of Saddleback and that it began with this uh, mm. this truth about hospitality and what it means mm. in people's lives. So that's a very, very powerful, wonderful book about that. Very helpful, I think. Yeah, Joyce read it, and she loved it. Yeah. Loved it. Well, thanks so much for being here, Tom. Thank you, guys. We'll have to do it again soon. We really appreciate yes. you. Everybody, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We love you. We'll see you next time. If you're a podcast listener and you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. And if you're thinking, hey, listening's great, but is there a way I can watch these episodes? Yeah, there is. Subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for video versions of these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you're already watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the podcast so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows, your question just might inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Doug Jones, and I hope you'll join us again next week.